Unit 1 continues with our discussion about blood, which is found in Chapter 14. And um, as I mentioned in the introduction video, we're going to refer back to this quite a bit throughout the um, this short summer session. And so um, paying attention during this chapter can really help you in a lot of other chapters. Um, so the blood, heart, and blood vessels are the circulatory system. And really that is so imperative because it links the body's internal and the body's external environments. So as blood circulates, it's going to move oxygen that we inhaled from the lungs to the body cells, and then the body cells need that oxygen to do work. And then we'll pick up the CO2 from the body cells and take them to, be, to the lungs to be exhaled. Uh, constituents like heat and clotting proteins, uh, transport proteins that like carry the um, steroid hormones, urea waste, hormones, ions, biomarkers, cells, and even cell fragments are all found within blood. Uh, there's chemical buffers that help regulate the pH of the body, and the blood plays such an important role in protection of our body, specifically with white blood cells. And a complete blood count is commonly used when you're trying to diagnose someone's illness and find out what's going on and then um, also to see how the body's responding to different types of therapy, whether it be, you know, uh, different chemicals or whatnot. What you see in this picture is a venule, which is a word for a small vein, and it has all these red blood cells in them. So you can see a lot of red blood cells. They're, they're called erythrocytes and, um, or RBCs, you might see them called. And um, they have this biconcave disc shape. And so you can kind of see that here, that this dip in one side. Now it's called biconcave because the dip is actually on both sides. So um, trying to find a good example of that. Maybe this cell right here dips a little bit on one side and, and a little bit on the other. But um, this is just showing you how May, I mean, to me, this is just amazing, this endothelial lining of the capillary, or venule, excuse me, and all this blood flowing through. So, as I mentioned, blood is a connective tissue with this liquid matrix, and um, it's the only liquid tissue of the body, and its job is to help regulate homeostasis, whether that be pH of the body or temperature. Um, it helps maintain the stability of the fluids of the body and like I said distributes heat when you see somebody attractive and you you blush that's actually you warming up and your vessels dilating allowing blood to flow close to the surface of skin to release that heat. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, of course the amount of blood you have varies from person to person depending on how big you are and how much adipose tissue you have. Unfortunately, I have quite a quite a good amount, but it is about 8% of your body weight. And for girls, that's uh, four to five liters, and males, it's five to six. And there are three types of what we call formed elements. And so I would underline or highlight that word formed elements. And the formed elements are your red blood cells, your white blood cells, and platelets, which are just fragments of cells. Now, next to red blood cell, you need to know that is also called erythrocyte. The prefix erythro means red and cyte is cell. White blood cell is leukocyte. So L, let's see if I can, oh, let me back up. Sorry, I'm so sorry. That's right. Okay. Is this worth doing? I wonder if I can text. No. Nope would be, this is too fast, Eurith, I mean too slow, erythrocyte, this is leuco, oh my gosh, I'm annoying myself, so I know you're annoyed, all right, erythro is red, and then C-Y-T-E is site. Let's never do that again. <laughs> oh my gosh. 
Okay. How do I get off of here? Okay. I think I got it figured out. Let's see. All right. Sorry about that. Won't do it again. So, um, what is blood made out of? The majority of blood is the plasma. <coughs> And plasma is going to be mainly made out of water. So blood is mainly made out of water, which is why it's aqueous. It's liquid tissue. The formed elements, as we mentioned, the erythrocytes, the leukocytes, and the platelets make up almost half of blood, with red blood cells being the high majority. Um, don't want a lot of white blood cells because white blood cells are going to be in high quantities responding to infection. So um, you want to, you know, this is an indicator that you're healthy if you don't have too high amount of white blood cells. And there are different types of white blood cells. So I love this, this slide here because it is a great overview of what blood is made of. Um, and the white blood cells are neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils and basophils. Now, why did I do that in that order? Why didn't I go in order like this? Well, it's because I was going in order from greatest amount to least, okay? And there's a saying, write it here in your notes, never let monkeys eat bananas. And that will help you remember, uh, or they'll bleed to death or something. I don't know. Con connect it with blood. Never let monkeys eat bananas. That's all the white blood cells in order of uh, highest composition to, to the lowest amount. Never let monkeys eat bananas. And these, all these white blood cells have different jobs in the immune system. And we'll kind of look at that a little bit later. But um, so if your monocytes are high, it would indicate one type of infection where the, the neutrophils would mean something else. Let's look at the plasma. We said it's mainly made of water and floating in that water are electrolytes. Electrolytes are just fancy term for ions. So there's ions like sodium ions and potassium ions. There's proteins, albumins and globulins and fibrinogens. There's waste products like urea I mentioned earlier. There's different nutrients like sugars and uh, amino acids that cells are gonna need vitamins that help cells do their functions, their enzymatic functions. There's hormones like we mentioned in our last chapter. And then of course those gases, oxygen and CO2, and then nitrogen gas is also found in a small amount. So when you draw blood to detect these abnormalities, one thing you might do is centrifuge the blood. And so you're gonna take your blood sample and centrifuge it, spin it around really fast, um, and, and analyze it. And what you're gonna find is the plasma is gonna actually be yellow color. It's kind of like a straw colored fluid. And it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna have ions in it and hormones. It's really small stuff, water molecules. So that's gonna be found at the top of the centrifuge. The heaviest things are the red blood cells, those big compared to water uh, molecules, big red blood cells and they're going to be pulled by that centripetal force to the bottom of the test tube. And we call the percentage of the red blood cells the hematocrit. So you can look at how much red blood cells form this pellet at the bottom of our, our centrifuge tube, and that will be our hematocrit. So you want to highlight that. Hematocrit is amount of red blood cells, you know, out of the total, the percentage. And in between these heavy red blood cells and this very light straw colored fluid at the top, you're gonna to find the buffy coat. So you might underline or highlight the buffy coat or write it in, right? And that's gonna be where our white blood cells and platelets are. And so it's this, uh, it kind of looks white and it's this film between the plasma and the red blood cell. Let's look at a picture of what that looks like. So here's somebody's drop blood being drawn and what it looks like with all the the homogeneous mixture, but then you centrifuge it and it separates, the heaviest things separate out first. And the longer you centrifuge it, the more um, different size objects you can centrifuge out. But so they're just showing you, this is all of the blood, but it's got separated into the plasma, the buffy coat and the hematocrit. <coughs> 
universal precautions are these safety measures that everybody uses to prevent transmission of bloodborne infectious disease and pathogens in the workplace. And this is mainly used for HIV and hepatitis. What does universal mean is that you imagine every patient has been exposed to some pathogen and you're protecting not only them, but you're protecting yourself from contracting and spreading that pathogen. Um, they estimate 47% of new infectious diseases are due to this unsafe practice of uh, injections. So all my nurses out there, you know that it's really important not to get a stick. And they do, uh, for different types of you know illnesses, you might have gloves and a mask. And there's, of course, uh, fume hoods and shark containers. And then just common sense things like keeping your area clean and washing your hands. So this won't be on the test, but it's, it is good to know. You need to know that. So let's talk more about these formed elements. Hematopoiesis is a verb. It's a process, and it is the formation of these formed elements. So whether you're making red blood cells, white blood cells, or platelets, they are made by the process called hematopoiesis. Poesis. So blood cells do all come from the red marrow. Um, there's hematopoietic stem cells or hemocytoblasts um, that make our red blood cells, our white blood cells, and our platelets. If you want to break this word down, hemo is blood, cyte is cells, so this is blood cell, and blast always means like immature. So these are stem cells, they're immature, they haven't developed into um, actual blood cells. So these hemocytoblasts or hematopoietic stem cells will give rise to more cells. And those start specializing and differentiating as they divide and clone each other um, in response to these growth factors. And so from hematopoietic stem cells, they differentiate into lymphoid stem cells and myeloid stem cells. Your lymphoid stem cells are going to give rise to lymphocytes. That's easy enough. Uh, myeloid stem cells give rise to everything else, um, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So the other white blood cells, uh, the neutrophils, not the lymphocytes, but uh, monocytes and, and things like that. And so here's that stem cell, and it divides and divides, and some of those differentiate into myeloid stem cells, some of those differentiate into lymphoid stem cells. Now remember, this is happening in the bone marrow, and that lymphoid stem cell will eventually differentiate, um, make a lot of lymphoblasts, and blast means immature. So this is an immature lymphocyte. And so some of those lymphocytes will be B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. Don't worry about plasma cell. I, we, we're not worrying about that right now. Uh, that will be in uh, our, I believe, next unit. Um, but the big picture here, hematocytoblast or hematopoietic stem cell differentiates into two different types. And then these create more cells with our lymphoblasts that can further differentiate. Let's look at our myeloid stem cells. Remember, it's going to be everything but the lymphocytes. So erythroblast, baby erythrocyte megakaryoblast, a big nucleus baby. <laughs> so it breaks apart and forms platelets. Myeloblast, well, I'm not sure what myelo means, but this is going to develop the rest of our white blood cells, uh, or a big portion of them, sorry, the granulocytes, the basophils, the eosinophils, and the neutrophils. And so, uh, you can think of like Dr. Phil is my show. So all the fills come from myeloblasts. The monoblast, mono means one. So this is just going to be one thing, and that's the monocytes. And, and those are our macrophages. So those erythrocytes, like I mentioned, are biconcave disc shaped and a huge portion of them, one third, is hemoglobin. And now hemoglobin is a, it's a globin, so it's a, a protein, and it transports oxygen, and it actually transports a little bit of CO2. We'll talk about that in the respiratory system, but 
Oxyhemoglobin is when the hemoglobin is filled with oxygen, and deoxyhemoglobin is when it, the hemoglobin is not completely filled with oxygen. So you have one, if you're looking at one cell, there's many hemoglobin molecules inside, and each one of them is going to attract four oxygen molecules. Now red blood cells don't have a nucleus, they don't divide on their own. So after about 120 days, they start to break down, the liver um, breaks them apart and, and recycles the material, and um, the bone marrow just keeps churning out these red blood cells. So we don't need a nuclei to carry the DNA because the bone marrow is making these um, stem cells to, to make more. And a mitochondria would not be an advantage to have in red blood cells because mitochondria use oxygen to make ATP molecules. And what does hemoglobin and red blood cells do? Well, they carry oxygen. So if you put mitochondria in there, the mitochondria is going to destroy all the oxygen that you're trying to carry. So the cells have evolved to not have nuclei and not have mitochondria, and it's more efficient that way. Again, they can't divide. And uh, they can make a little bit of ATP even without a mitochondria because they can go through the process of glycolysis where you break sugar in half and get a little bit of the energy out of those bonds. So this is that biconcave disc picture and um, what it looks like. Oftentimes um, when I look at these under the microscope, this area is so much thinner than this area, it almost looks white. The light shines through depending on how light your microscope, uh, how strong the light is, but a lot of these will look kind of like donuts um, under the microscope. Now red blood cell count is the number of red blood cells in a cubic millimeter or a microliter of blood, and there are some typical ranges for males, females, and children. Um, the red blood cell counts, like we mentioned, help you diagnose and evaluate uh, patients, and it reflects how much oxygen can be carried by the blood. Um, the more red blood cells that you have, the more hemoglobin you have, therefore the more oxygen you can carry. And, and if you have not enough, well, we, that's forms of anemia, right? Erythropoiesis, remember we said that is making, uh, sorry, that is different from hematopoiesis. Hematopoiesis is forming any of the blood cells. Erythropoiesis is just making the red blood cells. And again, this happens in red, in the bone marrow, specifically the red marrow. And when you are low in oxygen in your blood, this will cause kidneys and the liver to release the hormone erythropoietin, which stimulates the bone marrow to make red blood cells, to do uh, erythropoiesis specifically. And it is regulated by a negative feedback because within a few days of the secretion of that hormone, many new red blood cells are appearing in the blood. And what's happening? Well, they're carrying lots of oxygen. And so we're going to shut that um, process down. See, low oxygen caused the kidneys to release this. So if you increase the oxygen, the kidneys will stop releasing their hormone. So there are a few stages in development of a red blood cell. We start with our hemocystoblast or uh, hematos, um, I just lost the word. Help me, help me. Hematopoietic stem cell. Um, and then it becomes a erythroblast. And then it becomes a reticulocyte and then a erythrocyte. And you will want to know those as well. The uh, erythropoietin causes red blood cells to be made and these are how they're made. They go from hemat hemocystoblast, erythroblast, ure reticulocyte to erythrocyte. And I mentioned they do survive about 120 days. Um, you do need certain things in your diet to make red blood cells. For example, vitamin B and folic acid will help you um, create the DNA necessary to divide those stem cells. And then of course you need iron in your diet to make the hemoglobins that are found inside the red blood cell. Now anemia is a condition in which the oxygen carrying capacity is reduced and that might be because you don't have enough red blood cells, it might be because you don't have uh, the right shape hema hemoglobin, it might be because you don't have enough hemoglobin. There's a few different types of anemia but they all, all anemias are talking about how much oxygen you can carry and that you're lower. Uh, 
anytime you put prefix a or an in front of a word, it means, you know, lower. So here is that control the red blood cell production. That low blood stimulates the kidneys and liver to release their hormone, erythropoietin, which travels all through the body, but it's targeting the bone marrow, specifically the red marrow, which undergoes uh, erythropoiesis and makes more red blood cells. As you increase the number of red blood cells, you can increase oxygen, which shuts down the process of secretion, secreting the erythropoietin. So we also talked about vitamin B and iron and folic acid are all important for making red blood cells. I mentioned there's a few types of anemia. Here they are. You can have a, a hemorrhagic anemia just from losing blood, right? You, you don't have any red blood cells anymore if you bleed all over the place. You could have a bacterial infection um, that destroys red blood cells um, or a blood transfusion incompatibility. So you're you have antigens um, destroying red blood cells, or sorry, uh, antibodies destroying red blood cells. You could be have a, a certain intrinsic factor inadequacy or bone marrow issue. You could have actually low hemoglobin concentration, so you're iron deficient. Or you could have abnormally shaped hemoglobin, so they can't carry all the oxygen, for example, sickle cell anemia and thalassemia. And um, speaking of sickle cell, it's one of my, uh, I don't say, want to say favorite diseases, but it is one of the diseases I'm most interested in. I took a class through Harvard on sickle cell and trying to eradicate this problem. And it led me actually to some really interesting ideas I'd like to discuss one day and do research on um, to to cure sickle cell. Uh, I would like to win that um, award, right? So here's an iron deficient cells. Um, you can see they're, they're, they're just not carrying a whole lot in there. And then um, you can see these sickle cells here. This is what I meant by you can often see through cells. Um, so how do we treat sickle cell disease now? Well, Sickle cell disease is so interesting because it has such profound effects all because of one mutation on one gene on one chromosome. And it's a substitution mutation even, so it's very small, uh, like there's a T instead of an A. Um, and that, but, but that recipe, that gene codes for how to make hemoglobin and that one change um, causes the hemoglobin to have an abnormal shape. And what that does is the hemoglobins actually kind of link up like puzzle pieces and push the red blood cell to form these sickle shapes. And they become kind of sticky and, and they, they clot and, and block um, vessels, which is important because we don't want to block vessels. We need oxygen getting to our, all of our organs. So blocking narrow blood vessels is not good. And you could have some organ failure, right? Um, it causes you to be um, lose oxygen, and so that's going to make these cells actually sickle more and block more, and it causes severe pain. The red blood cells don't live for 120 days, resulting in more anemia and more fatigue. Um, so, how do we treat it? Well, children can be are diagnosed at birth, and they try to prevent infection of the spleen, but uh, Hydroxyurea is also given, and that stimulates the fetal hemoglobin to be made, um, which is better at carrying oxygen than adult hemoglobin, and so that will slow down some sickling a little bit. A, a, a very popular treatment is bone marrow transplant or stem cell transplant to cure the disease, and, um, and, and what I'm talking about are experiments correcting the mutation. and maybe using um, environmental changes to correct uh, these cells. After months of squeezing through these little bitty capillaries, of course the red blood cells you know, wear out and become fragile and they are removed by the spleen or liver <coughs> and broken down by macrophages through phagocytosis. And the hemoglobin, those important proteins that carry the oxygen for the red blood cell is separated into its four subunits. 
each globin chain with a heme, heme group. So you have four of those, four globin chains with four heme groups. And then we take the heme group and we break it down into iron and biliverdin. And then the iron is transported to the red blood, bone marrow um, by the protein transferrin. And I think I love the way they name that. They, it transfers iron um, from the spleen and liver back to the bone marrow where we need iron to make more you know, um, red blood cells. That biliverdin is often converted to bilirubin, and then those are excreted as bile pigments. Um, so made, bile is made by the liver and then stored in um, the gallbladder, right? So that's why it's kind of green. Uh, let's see, and then these chains of proteins are just broken down into their amino acids and recycled. So here are the major events of blood cell breakdown, and it's pretty much what we were just saying in a nice um, table for you. I like those. And this is showing um, those four heme groups, one, two, three, four, and here's those long proteins, those chains of amino acids. And so they take those apart, and then for this one heme group, we take the iron out, and we're left with biliverdin, and then biliverdin converted to bilirubin, um, and then excreted and stored in the, and th this is actually, um, yeah, excreted by the liver. And so there's the life cycle of a blood uh, cell, and so, and, and how the nutrients are absorbed by what you eat and go to the bone marrow to help you make these red blood cells through erythropoiesis, and then that is released and travels all through the body until they're worn out and then they go to the liver where they are phagocyzed. Here's this is a phagocyte and the hemoglobin is broken down into the protein and, and that's broken further down into amino acids and the heme group is transferred uh, broken down into iron and biliverdin. The iron goes back into the, 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 the capillaries of the blood and return to the bone marrow while the biliverdin is converted to bilirubin and released as bile, interestingly, into the intestines where we absorbed the nutrition. And some of that also, sorry, will be excreted through our urine. Okay, let's um, pause here. We've talked all about red blood cells and, and what blood is made of, and in our next lecture, we'll talk about white blood cells uh, in detail.